Okay, hello everybody, how are you? Been a few days since I've been back in the realm of the flower ornament of the Huayan, the Buddha Avatamsaka, the Buddha Garland Sutra, Buddha Flower Ornament Sutra. And um, so happy to be back actually. I just enjoy it when I sail along in it. I feel really happy. And uh, it takes me away from worrying about the Ukrainians and everything just temporarily, although I do. It doesn't end it, but it helps take it away a little bit, and it's so wonderful. And here it is, you see, if an enlightening being, and we are in the middle of the practice of universal good, uh, where I stopped last time, we, which is a wonderful chapter where Samantha Bhadra comes forth and speaks himself. And... Um, uh, at the request of the um, Buddha, he tells his own practice and uh, what he does in the world. And uh, uh, he, uh, he is the one who is the sort of emblem bodhisattva. Actually, he's also a Buddha. And then in the, there's a male and female Buddha that are the clear light itself sort of objective and subjective. They're one being, but they're also two beings in the sense of sort of objective, subjective. The experience of being clear light, which is where we all are. Actually, we are all in clear light to start with. You know, we've always been. Everything is fine with us there. Live or die is bliss. And uh, feel pain is uh, just illusory. And it's overridden always by the bliss of being in the clear light. And um, although that's it, when we're stuck into making real whatever we seem to be in front of us, and when we've already, without noticing that we're making the mistake of being something separate from what is in front of us, that is, we are not what is in front of us, which we actually are, um, we are actually the same as everything, animate and inanimate, that's in front of us. But when we make the mistake of thinking we're definitely different, then they, we will feel pain and so forth. That is the initial pain, in a way, that pain of separation. So universal good, as a bodhisattva, is a subjective being like us, who yet is total good, who there, because yet is sort of aware simultaneously that their experience of being separate is like a reflection in a mirror and some other deeper knowledge that they have simultaneous with that superficial knowledge as a, perceiving themselves as a separated, individuated being, uh, they also know that that's like a reflection in a mirror. It's like you see your face in the mirror, left, right, reverse, and you know that's not you simultaneously with you work with it as if it were you, and you put your, you shave, I shaved this morning. Someone might, if, if I was female, I might have put some makeup on, whatever it was. Uh, uh, you need it as a male, probably. But anyway, it's not a habit. And so the mirror, you both know it. There it's you, and it's not you at the same time. And you know that with the mirror reflection. So when you feel pain, you, you don't feel it in the mirror. It doesn't reflect your pain to you. So similarly, so universally good is the whole goodness of the clear light, which is the reality of the world, of the universe, of the world and the non-world if you will, if, if there was anything opposite than the world. And it's all good. And so he is the all good. Or she, it can be a she or a he, it doesn't matter. So anyway, he's doing his practice and we just started on that, which is wonderful. But that's where we begin. And I'm reading this and you're listening to it. It is recorded, much later you will listen to it. And then, but you, it's all the same. We're all clear light. And the recording and the machinery and the time, and it's all clear light. And it's all good. And it is just bliss, actually. And when we, when we let go into bliss, when we find that bliss in it, then that bliss is so powerful, it overrides the sense of separation and the sense of pain of being apart from it. And the universal good is the one who knows that even when they're in a situation apart from it. And the knowledge is so powerful, it splits universal good into being repeating and doing what he does in every atom of where he is. So that's a simultaneous 
double way of being. You're there doing it in one setting and you're doing it in the different universes in the, every atom of the setting. And you're also doing it in the universes in every atom of the atom of the setting and so on and so on. Infinitely toward zero, which never, never happens. There's no such thing. So it goes to micro, you can go endless microscope, just as you in the macro, you can go endless telescope. But, the, but you're present in all that, uh, that microscope and telescope as Samantabhadra. So you all are Samantabhadra. Every atom of your body or universe is where Samantabhadra is being all good. And that's all we have to do is find that in every atom of our cells, in every subatomic particle of our cells, in every pure energy that's not a particle. All right? And then, and in that case, we become an enlightening being, enlightening ourselves and enlightening everyone around us. Who is us? <laughs> really, we kind of know, although we don't habitually see it that way. If an enlightening being conceives a single feeling of anger toward enlightening beings. Like I once got mad in 1971 when I was in Uttarakhand in Almora looking up at the Himalayas, and I got mad with the enlightening beings that, they, that the Bangladesh genocide of the Bengalis by various Western Pakistanis soldiers, horrible thing was going on. And I was in a dream, at least, shouting at my guru, my teacher, my mentor, my dear friend, uh, my original root Geshe, Where's all the bodhisattvas? Where's all the Buddha near Manakayas, the emanation bodies of Buddhas, preventing this bayoneting of babies and horrible things that were going on there, just as they are now going on by the Ukraine, by helpless people who are driven by helpless fear and anger and hunger and, 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 and misinformation. And I said, where's all the bodhisattvas? Where are they? Where's all the Nirmanakayas? How can this be happening? So I was angry with the bodhisattvas for not being there. <laughs> and he never could answer when I was asking why and where and didn't answer. But in the dream, he became bigger than Mount Everest. And then I was like a little tiny atom myself shouting, where, where, where? <laughs> and uh, I was angry, so that was bad. And that produced a million obstacles such as these, the, the tremendous obstacles that we read about last time, so I'm not going to repeat them. But there are many, many obstacles of inability to cultivate the incorruptible path of enlightened beings, the obstacle of following the absolute state of one-sided detachment. That's like a, acting like there's a dualistic nirvana somewhere else away from this world. The obstacle of estrangement from the family of the Buddhas and enlightening beings of all time. So I have lived like a stranger because of that being angry at the enlightening beings for not being there to prevent it. Why? I do not see anything that is as big a mistake as for enlightening beings to become angry at other enlightening beings. Therefore, if great enlightening beings want to quickly fulfill the practices of enlightening beings, they should diligently practice ten principles in their minds. They should not abandon sentient beings. How would that work in the case now in Ukraine where they're sending missiles into apartments where there are babies and children and cellars and hospitals. Then, then, then what? Okay, I don't abandon, they got killed. But my mind doesn't abandon them because I know that they are not the body that was destroyed by that horrible missile. I follow them into the between. My mind, although I have no such magical power, but I will, that someone does, to carry them into a new and better body and to give them, take them maybe for a rest if they need in a heavenly place, and then bring them into a better human body if that, if that is helpful and if they choose that. And if they realize how the human one in the middle of all the different possible life forms, sort of not too dumb and not too smart, not too, not too magical and not too vulnerable, etc., you know, the way to become really fulfill the task of the enlightening being in the human realm. This is the best. So they might come back. So my mind wouldn't abandon them, is the point, even though they got killed. So in their minds, they should not abandon sentient beings. So I should have been doing that, thinking about the bardo and the between of all the people being senselessly killed by the stupid people who are being ordered to do it or who are like, for whatever reason, like, getting off on being sadistic and vicious, 
because they had become so completely helplessly alienated. And I don't give them up either. I don't abandon them. They're getting horrible consequences for themselves by being harmful to who they think of as other and actually harming themselves in worse way. And I, but I don't abandon them. I don't, like some of the Badra, you know, a light comes out of the head, or like Shakyamuni when he was in Tushita and brings everybody out of hell. You know. They should think of enlightening beings as Buddhas. So they're doing some strange dance of killing each other. That's okay. They're going to be Buddhas. They should never slander any teaching of the Buddhas. They should know that there is no end to different lands. So they don't need to fight over any particular one. <laughs> they should be profoundly devoted to enlightening practices. They should, which will be not killing each other. They should not give up the cosmic space like impartial mind of enlightenment. Should not. That's the mind of clear light, space like. It's but inconceivable because it can be it can be clear, can be bliss while solid and seeming even sharp or hard or whatever. They should contemplate enlightenment and enter the power of Buddhas to overcome even the most hostile, dangerous, and destructive things. They should cultivate unobstructed intellectual and expository powers to help others understand their, that the universe is good and there's no need to fight over things. They should teach and enlighten beings tirelessly. They should. Even the bad guys. They should live in all worlds without attachment in their minds. When great enlightening beings are living by these ten principles, they are able to embody ten kinds of purity. What are the ten? Purity of comprehension of the most profound truth. Purity of association with good associates. Purity of preserving the Buddha teachings. Purity of comprehension of the realm of space. Purity of profound penetration of the realm of reality. Now, I want to just say, purity of preserving the Buddha teachings, that doesn't mean some religious belief demand or some domination by a theory. Buddha teachings are teachings to enable us to understand reality that we are God, that we are reality, God good. If, if God really means good, we are good. We are universal good. That's the Buddha, Buddha universal good, good is practice of being universal good in every atom of our being. And we are really that. We get confused and we don't identify with what is really going on about us. Because, and, but the Buddha teachings help us as a scientist would as a doctor would point out our own reality, not for us to believe, but for us to experience. That's the key thing. That's the key thing. We might want to believe that we can experience what is real, what is really real, and we can distinguish it from what is illusorily real. That might be helpful to believe because that would urge us to experience it, not to just sit with a fanatical belief, but to actually experience the goodness, which we do through an awareness of bliss, through a subjectivity of bliss, giving over our subjectivity to bliss. That's how we do it. Purity of comprehension of the realm of space. It's not nothing. There's no nothingness. Purity of profound penetration of the realm of reality. Purity of observation of infinite minds. Purity, everyone has infinite minds. That's how our minds all interfold with each other. Purity of having the same roots of goodness as all enlightening beings. Purity of having the uh, a purity of non-attachment to the various ages. Purity of observation of past, present, and future. Purity of practice of all enlightening teachings. That's, those are great purities. When, when enlightening beings persist in these ten things, that is to say the ten principles, then the ten purities, they become imbued with ten kinds of broad knowledge. That is knowledge of all sentient beings' mental behavior. So then you know what beings are thinking, what they're doing, what their attitudes are. Knowledge of the consequences of actions of all sentient beings. Realizing which things they shouldn't be doing as well as which they should. And that includes yourself as one of the sentient beings. Knowledge of all Buddha teachings. Okay, that's scientific knowledge of reality, knowledge of the profound occult import of all Buddha teachings. This is the kind of magical technology of those who know reality, what they 
and therefore know their oneness with reality, how they can reshape reality to be good to every other being, to be best possible of every other being. Knowledge of all methods of concentration spells, though that's the scientific technology uh, formulae they are, really. Knowledge of interpretation of all writings, understanding things coming to them from other minds, enlightened minds through the word, written word. Knowledge of the language and speech of all sentient beings, being able to understand people no matter what they speak. Oh, you're, my guru was so right, I'm old now. I'm in my old age and I can't speak Russian and I can't understand it. And that is making me unhappy. It is definitely true. I'm also, my German sucks too. And that's bad. Knowledge of the benefit, and they both are making me unhappy. I have to go back to <laughs> Not to mention Arabic, Hebrew, Swahili. Also important. Spanish, French, Tibetan. Sanskrit, but not Hindi, that's terrible. Never mind. Knowledge of manifestation of their bodies is not about me. Knowledge of manifestation of their bodies in all worlds. Oh, that would be good. Knowledge, that's the magic body practice, actually. Knowledge of manifestation of their reflections in all assemblies. Knowledge of embodying omniscience in all realms of being. Ay, 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 ay. Realizing that we know everything. There's no excuse, therefore. Once great enlightening beings are established in, in this knowledge, they realize ten kinds of universal entry. All worlds enter one point. One point enters all worlds. All beings' bodies enter one body. One body enters all beings' bodies. Untold aeons enter one instant. One instant enters untold aeons. <laughs> That's the now. Shambhala is already here, so stop worrying about until we have to get rid of the bad guys and then we'll have Shambhala. No, don't worry about it. It's here now. All Buddhist principles enter one principle. One principle enters all Buddhist principles. The goodness of it all. The clear transparency of it all. One place, untold places, enter one place. One place enters all places. Untold faculties enter one faculty. One faculty enters untold faculties. All faculties enter non-faculty. Non-faculty enters all faculties. So when we're completely unconscious, all faculties are active. <laughs> and when we're, all faculties are active, we are unconscious. All perceptions enter one perception. One perception enters all perceptions. One utterance enters all utterances. All utterances enter one utterance. All pasts, presents, and futures enter one time frame. One time frame enters all pasts, presents, and futures. Amazing. Once great enlightening beings have contemplated in this way, they abide in ten kinds of sublime mind. The sublime mind in which none of the perceptions and thoughts of sentient beings can abide. So you don't get involved in different worries and things and, and feelings of pain. The sublime mind of the ultimate realm of space. That's the transparency, clear light of the void. The, the, the pure goodness and blissfulness of that. The sublime mind of the boundless cosmos, infinity of everything. The sublime mind of all the profound esoteric principles of Buddhahood. Esoteric only because of being misunderstood until we have know these principles, have these purities, have these broad knowledges, have these universal entries, you know, interpenetrations and entries, the jewel net of Indra, the holographic vision of the universe in space and time. Profound esoteric principles teach that. But they, so therefore, they don't need to be esoteric. They are always there, actually. We always know them in the profound mind of a nice omniscience that is in every atom. The sublime mind of the extremely profound state of non differentiation. The sublime mind annihilating all doubt and confusion. 
the sublime mind of the non-differentiated equality of all worlds, the sublime mind of the equality of all Buddhas of past, present, and future, the sublime mind of the infinity of the power of all Buddhas, so we can rely on it. We don't have to feel abandoned ourselves. We know that we are cared for and loved because that goodness, goodness, the universe being its reality, being goodness, means its reality is love because that means that it offers itself to know ourselves as itself, which is where we will be truly blissful and happy, which means it loves us. Once great enlightening beings abide in these ten kinds of sublime mind, Sublime means, you know, it's taken away. Sublime, it is underlying, subliminal. It's there all the time. We just haven't recognized it. But we already have that Buddhahood, that enlightenment. That's what it means. That's why they are sublime. They acquire ten kinds of technical knowledge of the Buddha teachings. Technical knowledge comprehending the most profound Buddha teaching. Technical knowledge of the production of far-reaching Buddha teachings. Technical knowledge of exposition of all kinds of Buddha teachings. Technical knowledge of realizing the Buddha teaching of equality. I love that he doesn't say Buddhist teachings. He says Buddha teachings. Technical knowledge could be Jesus' statements. Could be Krishna's statements. Could be Allah's statements. Muhammad's statements. Gabriel's statements. Lao Tzu's statements. Confucius' statements. William Blake statements, technical knowledge of understanding the Buddha teaching of, different, of differentiation, technical knowledge of understanding the Buddha teaching of non-differentiation, technical knowledge of profound penetration of the Buddha teaching of adornment, of beauty, technical knowledge of penetrating the Buddha teachings by one art, one means, one method. Technical knowledge of penetrating the Buddha teachings by innumerable means, arts, and methods. Technical knowledge of non-difference of the boundless Buddha teachings. Technical knowledge of non-regression in the Buddha teachings. Technical by one's own mind and one's own power. Which is the power of all Buddhas. Which is the omniscience of all Buddhas in everyone's mind. When great enlightening beings, that's esoteric though if you're going to misunderstand that. <laughs> when great enlightening beings have heard this teaching, they should all be inspired and respectfully accept and hold it. Why? Great enlightening beings who hold this teaching quickly attain unexcelled, complete, perfect enlightenment with a minimum of effort. And all are enabled to embody all qualities of Buddhahood equal to the qualities of the Buddhas of all times. Then by the spiritual power, you know, that's the end of what he said, Samantabhadra, the all-good Bodhisattva. Then by the spiritual power of the Buddha, as well as by natural law, in each of the ten directions, as many worlds as atoms, in ten unspeakable numbers of tens of quintillions of Buddha lands, all quaked in six ways, and rain showers from clouds, of all flowers surpassing those of the heavens, as well as clouds of perfumes, incenses, robes, canopies, banners, pennants, jewels, and all kinds of decorations. There rain clouds of music, clouds of enlightening beings, clouds of physical forms of untold Buddhas, clouds of infinite praises of the Buddhas, clouds of voices of Buddhas filling all universes, untold clouds of magically arrayed worlds, untold clouds developing enlightenment, untold clouds of light shining, and untold clouds of mystic manifestations expounding the teaching. This is like, you know, confetti parades, you know. <laughs> Confetti consists of worlds and beings and incenses and perfumes and lights and Buddhas and praises of Buddhas and hymns and shining lights and mystic manifestations expounding the teachings because the main thing is for everyone to open their mind through understanding. As in this world, at the site of enlightenment under the tree of enlightenment, in the palace of the enlightening being, the Buddha, the completely enlightened one, was seen expounding this teaching so it was in all worlds in the ten directions. So simultaneously what you do is repeated in infinite worlds, so be careful of what you do. 
Don't do bad things that they are endlessly repeated. Do good things and they are endlessly repeated. Very, very good. I was just listening to Elizabeth Watuti, a Greta Thunberg from Kenya, uh, but a little older than Greta, 25-year-old Greta Thunberg woman, inspired by the woman who planted zillion trees in Kenya, Wangari Matai, the late Wangari Matai. And this woman was talking, and then the one intelligent journalist next to her said that at COP26, what she said was, we take care of the tree, and the tree takes care of us. And I thought of Buddha under the tree, and this jewel tree, that, which is this jewel tree, incredible tree, that, that is revealed in this Buddha, our flower ornament sutra. Buddha flower ornament, Buddha flower ornament sutra, you know, uh, and the taking care of all beings, that tree, and he's taking care of that tree, and the tree and the man, and the tree and the Buddha are like interfused, and we're all Buddhas, and we're all interfused with the trees, and they will, they will rebalance things, they will reabsorb our pollution, they will transform it into oxygen, they will make life possible. Then the great enlightening being, universal good, by the spiritual power of the Buddha, and by the power of his own roots of goodness, looked over the ten directions throughout the cosmos, wishing to elucidate the practice of enlightening beings, to tell of the realm of enlightenment of the Buddhas, to explain the realm of great vows, to explain the reckoning of ages of all worlds, to clarify the timely appearance of the Buddhas, to explain how the Buddhas develop beings according to their faculties, appearing to let them attend them, to make it clear that the effort of the Buddha's appearance in the world is not wasted, to make it clear that the roots of goodness that are planted will surely bear fruit, and to clarify how sentient beings of great spiritual power manifest forms for all sentient beings, to teach and enlighten them, spoke these verses. So universal good, oh my God, it's just to read, I'm going to read that again. Then the great enlightening being universal good, by the spiritual power of the Buddha and by the power of his own roots of goodness, looked over the ten directions throughout the cosmos, wishing to... That's why in the tantras, you know, you have many heads, you know, because you're looking in all directions simultaneously, and many eyes looking in all directions, not just the two looking forward. Wishing to elucidate the practice of enlightening beings, to tell of the realm of enlightenment of the Buddhas, to explain the realm of great vows, to explain the reckoning of ages of all worlds, to clarify the timely appearance of the Buddhas, to explain how the Buddhas develop beings according to their faculties, appearing to let them attend them, to make it clear that the effort of the Buddha's appearance in the world is not wasted, to make it clear that roots of goodness are planted will surely, that are planted will surely bear fruit, and to clarify how enlightening beings of great spiritual power manifest forms for all sentient beings to teach and enlighten them spoke these verses. You should rejoice, get rid of all veils, and single-mindedly listen with respect to the vows and acts of enlightening beings. It's like a rap. It's like rap music versus the enlightening being. It was in Sanskrit. It was in meter. And in Tibetan translation, it's a metered line, usually seven or nine syllables. And then in English, it's so strung out with all its declensions and its, sub, its prefixes and suffixes and different things and prepositions. It's hard to fit in that kind of a meter, but someday they will all be there like that. The enlightening beings of the past were supreme lions of humanity. The practice they carried out, I shall tell in order. I will also tell the numbers of ages, the worlds and acts and the peerless honored ones who emerged therein. As for those past Buddhas who appeared in the world by their vows, how did they destroy afflictions and addictions for all sentient beings? All the lions of philosophy continued practice to fulfillment because the lions of philosophy become lions of science. They conquer delusion and confusion and they help themselves and others find out what reality is. All the lions of philosophy continue practice to fulfillment, attaining the state of equality of Buddhas, the realm of omniscience. That is, everyone becomes equal to Buddhas and everyone's equal to omniscience. Seeing all the human lions of past ages 
emanating great networks of lights, illumining the worlds of the ten directions they reflected and made their vow. I should quote, I should be a lamp for the world, replete with the virtues of Buddhahood, their ten powers, their omniscience. All sentient beings burn with greed, anger, and folly. I should save and free them, have them extinguish the pains of the states of woe, end quote. They make such vows, steadfast, unregressing, to cultivate all enlightening practices and gain the unimpeded ten powers. Having made such vows, they cultivate practice without shrinking back. None of their actions are in vain. Thus they are called lions of philosophy. In one aeon of virtue, a thousand Buddhas emerge in the world. Their universal eyes I will explain in order. As in one aeon of virtue, so too in measureless aeons, those future Buddhas' practices I will explain distinctly. As in one type of Buddha land, so in numberless lands, the practice of future Buddhas I will now explain. Buddha's successive emergence in the worlds, what were their vows, what were their names, what were the prophecies they received, what were their lifespans, what were the true principles they practiced, solely seeking the unobstructed path, who were the beings they taught, how long their right teaching remained in the world, what were the Buddha lands they purified, the sentient beings there in the cycles of teaching, their explanation of proper and improper timing, progressively purifying beings, what were the actions of the beings, their patterns and inclinations, high, middling, low, not the same, how they influenced them to practice. Penetrating such knowledge, the future Buddhas cultivated the supreme practice, or was doing the work of universal good, widely freeing the living. Physical actions unimpeded, verbal actions all pure, mental actions all thus, always like this at all times, enlightening beings acting thus, consummate the path of universal good, producing the sun of pure knowledge, illumining the cosmos. The lands of future aeons are unspeakably many in number. They know them all in an instant without discrimination between them. Those who practice can enter into such a supreme state. Of these principles of enlightening beings, I shall tell a little. Knowledge and wisdom boundless, they realize the scope of Buddhahood, Entering completely therein, their practice does not regress. Replete with universal good wisdom, they fulfill universal good vows and enter the peerless knowledge I shall tell of their practice. In a single atom, they see all worlds. If sentient beings should hear of this, they'd go mad in confusion. As in one atom, so in all atoms, all worlds enter therein, so inconceivable is it. In every single atom or all things of all places and times, the states and lands innumerable, the enlightening discern and know. In every single atom are countless kinds of Buddha lands, and each kind is also countless, they know all in one, all the various different features that there are in the cosmos. The types of beings each different they can discern and know. Deeply entering subtle knowledge, they distinguish the worlds, they be the becoming and decay of all ages, they can clearly explain. They know the length and brevity of all ages, and that past, present, and future are one moment. The sameness and difference of myriad practices, they all distinctly know. They penetrate all worlds, vast and small, one body, countless lands, one land, countless bodies. The innumerable features of the worlds of different species in the ten directions, they know entirely. Those of most profound knowledge comprehend the becoming and decay of the numberless lands of past, present, and future. Of the worlds in the ten directions, some are forming, some decaying. Infinite though they be, the virtuous comprehend them all. There are some lands with variously adorned ground, and the beings are also adorned. This is due to purity of action. Then again, some lands have countless kinds of pollution. This is due to beings experiencing everything according to their acts. Infinite boundless worlds, the enlightening know, are one land. Thus do they enter all lands whose number cannot be known. All worlds enter one land. The worlds do not become one, yet there is no mix-up. Worlds are inverted and upright. Some high, some low, all are the perceptions of beings, the enlightening discern them all. 
The wide worlds are infinite, boundless, they know all kinds are one, and know that one is various. The universally good offspring of Buddha can by universal good knowledge know the number of lands, though the number is boundless. They know the projection of worlds, the projections of lands and beings, the projections of teachings and Buddhas, all to the ultimate point. All worlds, micro and macro, cosmic, various different arrays all arise from action. Infinite enlightening beings learn to enter the reality realm. Their spiritual powers free. They reach everywhere in the ten directions. Infinite enlightening beings learn to enter the reality realm. Their spiritual powers free. They reach everywhere in the ten directions. If the names of those worlds were spoken for aeons as many as beings, they still could not all be told. Only Buddha can reveal them. The various names of the worlds and Buddhas could not be fully told even in countless aeons. The most excellent wisdom, the teaching of Buddhas of all times, are born from the reality of her. the most excellent wisdom, the teachings of Buddhas of all times are born from the realm of reality and fill the state of enlightenment with pure, unobstructed mindfulness, boundless, unimpeded wisdom. They analyze the reality realm to reach the other shore, the worlds of the past, great and small, the arrangements they have developed. Buddhas know in an instant the human lions therein cultivate the various practices of Buddhas, attain to true awakening and manifest their freedoms. Enlightening beings know all such Buddhas of the future, the most noble of humans in boundless ages to come, all their undertakings, all their various states, how they strive in practice and therein attain enlightenment. They know their congregations, their lifespans, and the beings they teach, by what means they teach, turning the wheel of truth for the masses. I'm thinking here, every being either killing or dying or being killed in the Ukraine are all Buddhas of the future. They are all the most noble of humans, the victims and the perpetrators both. In boundless ages to come, all their undertakings, all their various states, how they strive in practice and therein attain enlightenment, and they will never more do that. And they will never more be such victims. Except if they give themselves. They know their congregations, their lifespans, and the beings they teach, by what means they teach, turning the wheel of truth for the masses. Knowing this, enlightening beings abide in the stage of universal good practice, their knowledge and wisdom thoroughly clear, giving birth to all the Buddhas, Makes me think of Thich Nhat Hanh. They enter deeply into all the Buddha lands. They are in the present and arrive at the reality realm. All the present Buddhas in those worlds, all of them, are masters of teaching unhindered in discourse. They also know their congregations, pure lands, and adaptive powers. For countless million aeons, they always ponder these things. The awesome psychic powers and endless stores of knowledge of the noble tamers of the world, the enlightening beings know all, producing unobstructed eyes, unobstructed ears, noses, bodies, and unobstructed universal tongues. They can gladden sentient beings. Their supreme unobstructed minds are broad and totally pure, their knowledge pervading all. They know all things of all times. They study all projections, projections of lands and beings, of worlds and civilizations, and finally reach the other shore of projections. The various distinctions of all worlds are all are there due to perceptions and thoughts. Entering Buddha's knowledge of means and arts, they clearly understand all this. Each for each of untold groups, they manifest embodiment, causing all to see the Buddha and liberating boundless being. The profound knowledge of Buddhas is like the sun coming out in the world, ever appearing everywhere in all lands and places. They realize all worlds are provisional names without reality. Sentient beings and worlds are like dreams, like shadows. They do not produce false discriminatory views about the things in the world. Those free from false discrimination do not even see false discrimination. Measureless, countless aeons, they understand are one moment, and they know a moment has no moment. 
Thus do they see the world. <laughs> Innumerable lands they cross over in an instant, yet through measureless aeons they don't move from their original place. Untold aeons or the space of a moment, not seeing long or short, they find ultimate instantaneousness. Mind is in the world, world is in the mind. Without this, about this, they do not wrongly create discriminations of duality and non-duality. Beings, worlds, ages, Buddhas and Buddha teachings, all are like illusory projections in the reality realm. All is equal. Throughout the lands of the ten directions, they manifest infinite bodies. Knowing bodies arise from conditions, they have no attachment at all. Based on non-dual knowledge, they manifest the Buddhas without attachment to non-duality, knowing there is no duality or non-duality. They realize that all worlds are like flames, like lights, like echoes, like dreams, like illusions, like emanations. Thus they accordingly enter the sphere of action of the Buddhas and achieve universal good knowledge, illumining all the profound realm of truth. Attachment to beings and lands they completely give up, yet rouse minds of great compassion and purify all worlds. Enlightening beings always rightly remember the marvelous teachings of the Buddhas, pure and clear as space, yet producing great expedient arts. Seeing the world always deluded, they determine to save and liberate all. Their undertakings are all pure, extending throughout all universes. Buddhas and enlightening beings, Buddha principles and things of the world, if you see their reality, all are no different from one another. Buddha's reality body matrix is in all worlds, yet while being in the world has no attachment to the world. Just as in clear water reflections have no coming or going, the reality body's being in the world is also like this. Thus freed from attachment, body and world are both pure, clear and still as space. There is no birth at all. Knowing the body has no end, no birth and no destruction, being neither eternal nor impermanent, they show it in all worlds. Destroying false views, they point out correct insight. The essence of things has no coming or going, is uninvolved with self or possession. As when a skilled musician causes various things to appear, their coming is from nowhere and they go nowhere the nature of illusions is not finite, nor is it infinite, but in the midst of the crowd he manifests the finite and infinite. Similarly, by mind in silent concentration, cultivating roots of goodness produces all Buddha. Neither finite nor infinite. Fin finiteness and infinity are deluded notions. Comprehending all states of being, the enlightening do not cling to finiteness or infinity. The Buddha's most profound truth is vast, deep, ultimate quiescence. Their profound, measureless knowledge knows the deepest states. Enlightening beings are freed from delusion. Their purity of mind is continuous. By means of spiritual powers, they skillfully liberate numberless beings. To those not at rest, they bring rest. To those at peace, they show the sight of enlightenment. Thus do they go throughout the cosmos, their minds without attachment, not dwelling on ultimate reality and not entering nirvana. Thus they go throughout the worlds, enlightening living beings, the classes of phenomena and beings they know without being attached, everywhere showering the rain of truth, they fill and enrich all worlds. In all worlds they realize true awakening moment to moment, yet cultivate the practice of enlightening beings without ever retreating. The various bodies in the world they know all completely, thus knowing physical phenomena they realize the body of Buddhas. They know all sentient beings, all ages and lands throughout the ten directions boundless entering fully into the ocean of knowledge. Beings' forms are infinite, for each the Buddhas manifest a body. The Buddha's bodies are boundless, the wise observe them all. What they know in one moment manifests the Buddha's, impossible to fully tell even in measureless aeons. The Buddha's can manifest their bodies passing, pa the Buddha's can manifest their bodies passing finally away in any place. 
in an instant innumerable relics are individually divided. Thus those of certain knowledge know the infinite will for enlightenment of the seekers of Buddhahood in all the ages to come. Ability to know in this way all the enlightened ones of past, present, and future is called maintaining the practice of universal good. Thus distinctly knowing countless stages of practice entering the abode of wisdom, the cycle never rolls back. Subtle, extensive knowledge enters deeply into the sphere of Buddhahood and having entered, not regressing, is called universal good wisdom. All the supremely noble ones enter the realm of Buddhahood, their practice never regressing. They attain unexcelled enlightenment. The different individual actions of infinitely many minds all come from accumulation of conceptions. The equanimous know them all. Defiled or undefiled, learners' minds, non-learners' minds, untold numbers of minds they know at every moment. They know they are not one or two, not defiled and not pure, and also without mixture all arise from one's own notions. Thus they clearly see all living beings with minds and thought each different, creating different worlds. By such means cultivating supreme practice and being reborn from the teaching they can be called universal good. Sentient beings all wrongly produce the conceptions of good and bad states. Because of this, they may be born in heaven or then fall into hell. Enlightening beings see the worlds as produced by the action of false ideas. Because false ideas are boundless, infinite too are the worlds. All lands are manifestation of the network of conceptions. By the means of the nets of illusion, one can inst instantly enter them all. Eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and the intellect, too, are thus. Conceptions of the world are different. All can be equally contained therein. In each object of the eye, there are infinite eyes imminent. Their various natures different, measureless, unspeakable. What is seen has no difference and also no mix-up. Everyone, according to his own acts, experiences the resulting consequences. The power of universal good is infinite, knowing them all completely. In all objects of eyes there is great knowledge imminent. Thus enlightening beings know distinctly every worldly realm and cultivate all enlightening practices without ever turning back. Buddhas teach, beings teach, all lands teach too. Everything in all times teaches thus. The enlightening ones know every particular the future is the past, the present is the future, the three times look to each other, the enlightening understand each. Thus in infinite ways they awaken the worlds, no boundaries can be found to the means of total knowledge. Those are the all goods, universal goods versus his rap. So now we come to a longer chapter, the book 37, called Manifestation of Buddha. This chapter we will not finish, but we will embark to keep it going. Book 37. So that's Samantha Bandra introducing us to everything, the microverse, the macroverse, unbelievable. Everything in one, one, and everything, time and space, and mind and mindless, nirvana and samsara duality and non duality, just completely, and quiescence and speech, both. Wonderful. Manifestation of Buddha, book 37. Then, from the circle of white hair between his brows, that's the urna, it's a tuft, like a little tuft of white hair, right there where the third eye would be, right there, a little above the line of the brows, just here. The Buddha emitted, then from the circle of white hair between his brows, the Buddha emitted a great beam of light called manifestation of the realizer of thatness, accompanied by countless trillions of light beams. That light illumined all the worlds in the whole cosmos, circling ten times to the right, revealing the immeasurable powers of the enlightened, 
awakening countless, countless enlightening beings, shaking all worlds, extinguishing the suffering of all states of misery, eclipsing the abodes of all demons, and showing all Buddhas sitting on the seat of enlightenment, attaining perfect awakening, as well as all the assemblies at the sites of enlightenment. Having done all this, then entered the light returned and circled the assembly of enlightening beings, then entered the head of the enlightening being, wondrous qualities of natural origination of Buddha. Now the masses at this enlightenment site were elated, ecstatic. They thought, how extraordinary. Now that the Buddha has radiated great light, surely he will expound a most profound great teaching. Then the enlightening being wondrous qualities of natural origination of Buddha on a lotus blossom seat, bared his right shoulder, Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. knelt, it's okay, knelt on his right knee, joined his palms, turned toward the Buddha with total attention, and spoke these verses. The truly awake, the virtuous, the great sage emerges comprehending all objects, reaching the other shore, equal to the Buddhas of past, present, and future. Therefore, I now pay reverent obeisance. Having risen to the shore of the signless realm and appeared in a body magnificently arrayed with wondrous marks, he radiates thousands of undefiled beams of light and destroys the hordes of demons entirely. All the worlds in the ten directions he causes to quake without exception, yet without frightening a single sentient being. Such is the spiritual power of the felicitous one. I just want to say that the hordes of demons destroyed means they lose all their bodies as demons, as hordes of demons. But no one is destroyed. They then enter into between states and the very light that the Buddha radiates that destroyed their demon bodies bears them along toward all good bodies to find the all goodness in themselves, only destroying their demonicness, demonishness. All the worlds in the ten directions he causes to quake without it, and therefore, in a way, this is the Buddhist theory of nonviolence and the, the Buddha scientific theory of true nonviolence, of not killing ever in that that in that only you can liberate f someone from a body in which harm is being performed and committed if you are completely with them past that body. So you need to have the subtle awareness and the subtle energy form that completely goes with the deepest energy of the life force of the being. You cannot do that if you think you're getting rid of them totally. Then, that's, then there's no excuse. And that's why no army can be mobilized, really, by people who know Buddha science. People who do not know, you know, cannot mobilize armies to aggress on anybody. That's really important. So that light is not aggressing on anybody. It is only removing aggressors from bodies in which they are harming themselves by aggressing on others and removing them into plain where they will not have such aggressive bodies. They, you know, where they will be encouraged to choose non-demonic embodiments, not to aggress. All the worlds in the ten directions he causes to quake without exception, yet without frightening a single sentient being, such as the spiritual power of the felicitous one. In other words, nice earthquakes. <laughs> Just a little shake up kind of earthquakes, loosening up, freeing up earthquakes, not destructive earthquakes. Equal in essence to space and the cosmos, he can remain as stable as they. All the living without count or measure, he has destroyed evil and removed defilements. Working hard at austere practices for countless ages, he fully attained the highest enlightenment. His knowledge unhindered in the midst of all objects of the same nature as all the Buddhas, the guide radiates these great beams of light, shaking the worlds in the ten directions, 
displaying measureless mystic powers, they have returned and entered my body, well able to learn the definitive teaching countless enlightening beings have assembled here and inspired me to ask about the teaching, wherefore I now petition the sovereign teacher. This assembly is now clear and serene, able to liberate all in the world, their wisdom boundless without attachment, such eminent sages have all gathered here. The benefactor of the world, the noble guide, with wisdom and energy beyond measure, now illumines the crowd with great light, causing me to ask about the unexcelled teaching. Who can truly expound in full? Who can truly expound in full the profound realm of the great wizard? Who is the inheritor of the Buddha doctrine? Noble guide of the world, please show us. This was the statement of the Buddha, of the, of the enlightening being, wondrous qualities of natural origination of Buddha. Then the Buddha emitted a great beam of life, of light. <laughs> then the Buddha emitted a great beam of light called unimpeded confidence from his mouth accompanied by countless trillions of light beams, illumining all worlds in the cosmos, circling ten times to the right, showing the various controlling powers of the Buddha, awakening innumerable enlightening beings, shaking all the worlds of the ten directions, extinguishing the pains of all states of misery, eclipsing all abodes of demons, and showing all the Buddhas on the seat of enlightenment attaining true awakening, as well as the assemblies at all those states. With all those sites, please expound with pure mind the great phenomena of Buddha's manifestation. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong. No, that's what, yeah, I, there's a page. As well as assemblies at all those sites of enlightenment. Having done all this, the lights came back, circled the assembly of enlightening beings, and entered the mouth of the enlightening being universally good, after which the body and lion throne of universal good surpassed their former condition and that of the other enlightening beings a hundredfold, surpassing all except the lion throne of the Buddha. Then the enlightening being wondrous qualities of natural origination of Buddha asked the great enlightening being universally good, this quote, this vast miraculous display manifested by the Buddha, causing all the enlightening beings joy, is inconceivable, incomprehensible to the world. What is this auspicious sign? Universal Good replied, In the past, when I saw Buddhas show such tremendous mystic displays, they expounded the teaching of the manifestations of Buddha. I think that now, since he has displayed this sign, he is going to expound this teaching. When this teaching is expounded, the whole earth quakes and immeasurable lights asking about the teaching are produced. Then the enlightening being wondrous qualities of natural origination of Buddha as the enlightening being universally good. How should great enlightening beings know the principle of the manifestation of the Buddhas, those who realize thusness, those who are truly awake? Please tell us. These countless trillions of enlightening beings have all cultivated purifying practice for a long time. Their recollection and precise awareness is fully developed. They embody the dignity of all Buddhas. They have reached the consummation of ultimate great adornment. They correctly remember all Buddhas without forgetting. They observe all sentient beings with great compassion. They know with certainty the spheres of spiritual powers of great enlightening beings. They have already received the support of the spiritual power of Buddhas. They are able to receive the sublime teachings of all Buddhas. Imbued with immeasurable such virtues, they have all come and gathered here. You have already attended and served countless quintillions of Buddhas, accomplished the supreme practice of enlightening beings, have attained mastery of all modes of concentration, have penetrated the esoteric secrets of all Buddhas, know all ways of enlightenment, have put an end to all doubt, are supported by the spiritual power of the Buddhas, know the faculties of sentient beings and explain ways of genuine liberation to them according to their inclinations, follow the knowledge of Buddha, expound the Buddha teachings and have realized the other shore. You have infinite such virtues worthy of praise. Please explain the phenomena of the manifestation of the Buddhas, those who realize thusness, the truly awake, 
their physical forms, utterances, states of minds, practices, enlightenment, and preaching until their manifestation of entry into ultimate extinction and the roots of goodness generated by seeing, hearing, and associating with them. Please tell us about all these things. Then the enlightening being wondrous qualities of natural origin of Buddha, desiring to reiterate his point, spoke these verses to the enlightening being, universal good. Excellent sage of unimpeded wisdom, you are well aware of the boundless realm of equality. Please explain the practices of infinite Buddhas. The enlightening beings will be happy to hear them. It's like an opera, really. How can enlightening beings follow and comprehend the Buddha's emergence in the world? What are their spheres of body, speech, and mind? Tell us this and their spheres of action, too. How do Buddhas attain to enlightenment? How do Buddhas turn the wheel of the teaching? How do the blissful ones pass away? The masses will be happy to hear. Of those who see the Buddha's great spiritual sovereigns, attend them and develop roots of goodness, please tell us the stores of virtue and what the beings who see them attain. If any hear of Buddha's names, whether present in the world or extinct, and deeply believe in their treasury of merit, tell us how they will benefit. Those enlightening beings, all in an attitude of respect, are gazing at the Buddha and at you and me. Please tell them of the ocean of virtues which purifies living beings. Please explain the meanings in the wondrous teaching with stories and examples. When beings hear, they will be greatly inspired. Their doubts will end and their knowledge will be clear as space. Please explain the meaning like the glorified bodies manifested by Buddhas throughout all lands, by marvelous speech stories and examples, please show the enlightenment of Buddhas like them. In millions of Buddha lands in the ten directions, in countless billions of aeons, it is hard to see such enlightening beings as have gathered here now. These enlightening beings all are reverent, eager for the subtle doctrine, Please expound with pure mind the great phenomena of Buddha's manifestation. Then the enlightening being, universal good, said to the great congregation, then, no, that's not, that's, uh, that's end. Now he's it, now, now the description. Then the enlightening being, universally good, said to the great congregation of enlightening beings, this matter is inconceivable. The Buddha, the one who realizes thusness, the worthy, the truly awake, becomes manifest by means of infinite phenomena. Why? It is not by one condition, by one phenomenon, that the manifestation of Buddha can be accomplished. It is accomplished by ten infinities of things. What are the ten? It is accomplished by the mind of enlightenment that took care of infinite sentient beings in the past. It is accomplished by the infinite supreme aspiration of the past. It is accomplished by great benevolence and compassion, which infinitely saved all sentient beings in the past. It is accomplished by infinite continuous commitments of the past. It is accomplished by infinite cultivation of virtues and knowledge tirelessly in the past. It is accomplished by infinite service of Buddhas and education of sentient beings in the past. It is accomplished by infinite pure paths of wisdom and arts in the past. It is accomplished by infinite pure virtues of the past. It is accomplished by infinite ways of, of beautification in the past. It is accomplished by infinite comprehensions of principles and meanings in the past. When these infinite, incalculable aspects of the teaching are fulfilled, one becomes a Buddha. It is as a billion world universe is not formed just by one condition nor by one phenomenon. It can be formed only by innumerable conditions, innumerable things. That is to say, the rising and spreading of great clouds and showering of great rain produces four kinds of atmosphere, continuously making a basis. What are these four? One is called the holder because it can hold the great waters. Second is called the evaporator because it can evaporate the great waters. Third is called the structure because it sets up all places. Fourth is called arrangement because the arrangement and distribution are all functional. These are all produced by the joint actions of sentient beings and by the roots of goodness of enlightening beings, enabling all sentient beings to get the use of what they need. 
innumerable such causes and conditions form the universe. It is such by the nature of things. There is no producer or maker, no knower or creator, yet the worlds come to be as a group phenomenon, a group activity. Everyone makes it all together, both enlightened and unenlightened. The manifestation of Buddha is also like this. It does not come about through just one conditional thing, but by innumerable causes and conditions, innumerable phenomena. That is, having heard, received, and held the clouds and rain of the great teaching from past Buddhas, by this can be produced the four kinds of atmosphere of great knowledge of the enlightened. What are these four? One is the atmosphere of great knowledge of mental command, able to retain memory without forgetting, being able to hold the great clouds and rain of teachings of all Buddhas. Second is the atmosphere of great knowledge, producing tranquility and insight, being able to evaporate all afflictions. Third is the atmosphere of great knowledge of skillful dedication, being able to perfect, or perfect all roots of goodness. Fourth is the atmosphere of great knowledge, producing undefiled, variegated, magnificent arrays of, adorn of beautification, of beauties, causing the roots of goodness of all beings sought in the past to be purified and consummating the power of the untainted roots of goodness of the enlightening. The Buddha's attainment of enlightenment is in this way, is thus by the nature of things, without production or creation, it nevertheless takes place. This is the first characteristic of the manifestation of the completely enlightened, the truly awake, great enlightening being should know it as such. That's so amazing. It's like, it's like Genesis. The Genesis, not by one creator, but by the creative activity of both enlightened and unenlightened working together, creating these four atmospheres, and the creation of a Buddha by four atmospheres, done by the one being who becomes the Buddha. But it's like creating a world, a universe, for the benefit of other beings. One creates a Buddhahood for the benefit of other beings. Furthermore, just as when a billion world universe is about to form, the rain, that's a galaxy, you know. The rain, billion world doesn't mean billion star. It means that there are billion planetary systems wherein there are humanoid planets, for sure. And each humanoid one connects to heavens and hells. And then it's a, like a column in the middle of it. But the complexity of third from the sun, sun a certain size, etc., the billions of them in a galaxy. Furthermore, just as when a billion world universe is about to form, the rain falling from the great clouds, so there's water, actually, rather than some explosive fire, you know, it's water, called the deluge, cannot be absorbed or held by any place except the universe when it is about to form. In the same way, when the Buddha rouses the clouds of the great teaching and showers the rain of the great teaching, those of the two lesser vehicles whose minds and wills are narrow and weak cannot absorb or hold it. That means the vehicle of the apostle, Shravaka, the vehicle of the hermit Buddha, Pratyeka, or the self-enlightened one cannot absorb or hold it. This is possible only for the great enlightening beings with the power of mental continuity. This is the second characteristic of the manifestation of Buddha. Great enlightening beings should know it as such. Furthermore, just as sentient beings, by the force of their acts, shower rain from great clouds, which do not come from anywhere or go anywhere, in the same way great enlightening beings, by the power of their roots of goodness, rouse the clouds of the great teaching and shower the rain of the great teaching, yet it comes from nowhere and goes nowhere. This is the third characteristic of the manifestation of Buddha. Great and loud enlightening beings should know it as such. Furthermore, just as no beings in water, you know, is defined as the great element, as cohesiveness. It's, that's what water is, is cohesiveness. Furthermore, just as no beings in the universe can count the drops of rain pouring from great clouds and would go crazy, oh, I'm sorry, no beings in the universe can count the drops of rain pouring from great clouds and would go crazy if they tried. For only the overlord God of the universe by the power of roots of goodness cultivated in the past is aware of every single drop. In the same way the Buddha produces great clouds of teachings and showers great rain of teachings that all sentient beings, seekers of personal salvation and self-enlightened ones cannot know. And they would surely go mad if they tried to assess them in thought. 
only the great enlightening beings, lords of all worlds, by the power of awareness and intellect cultivated in the past, comprehend every single expression and phrase and how they enter beings' minds. And this is the fourth characteristic of the manifestation of Buddha. Great enlightening beings should know it as such. Furthermore, it is as when great clouds shower rain, there is a great cloud raining called the extinguisher because it can extinguish fires. There is a great cloud raining called producer because it can produce floods. There is a great cloud raining called stopper because it can stop floods. There is a great cloud raining called maker because it can make all kinds of jewels. There is a great cloud raining called distinguisher because it can distinguish the billion worlds of the universe. The Buddha manifesting is also like this, producing great clouds of teaching, showering great rains of teaching. There is a great rain of teaching called extinguisher because it can extinguish all sentient beings' addictions. There is a great rain of teaching called producer because it can produce all sentient beings' roots of goodness. There is a great rain of teaching because it's called stopper because it can stop all sentient beings' delusions of views. There's a great reign of teaching called maker because it can make all jewels of wisdom. There's a great reign of teaching called distinguisher because it distinguishes the inclinations of all sentient beings. This is the fifth characteristic of the manifestation of Buddha. Great enlightening beings should know it as such. Furthermore, just as the great clouds rain water of one flavor, yet there are innumerable differences according to where it rains. In the same way, Buddha appears in the world, appearing in the world, rains water of teaching of one flavor, of great compassion. Yet his sermons accord to the needs of the situation and are infinitely variegated. This is the sixth characteristic of the manifestation of Buddha. Great enlightening beings should know it as such. Furthermore, as when a billion world universe first forms, the abodes of the heavens in the realm of form are made first then the abodes of the heavens in the realm of desire, and then the abodes of human and other beings. Similarly, Buddha appearing in the world first produces the knowledge of practices of enlightening beings, then the knowledge of practices of individual illuminates, then the knowledge of the practices of listeners, then the knowledge of practices of the conditional roots of goodness of other sentient beings. Just as the great clouds of rain water of one flavor, while the abodes created are variously dissimilar according to the differences in roots of goodness of the sentient being, but a spiritual rain of the one flavor of compassion has differences according to the vessels or capacities of sentient beings. This is the seventh characteristic of the manifestation of Buddha. Great enlightening beings should know it as such. Furthermore, when the worlds are beginning... There is a great flood filling the billion world universe, producing enormous lotus flowers called a ray of jewels of virtues of the manifestation of Buddha, which cover the surface of the waters, their radiance illumining all worlds in the ten directions. Then the overlord God, the gods of the pure abodes and so on, seeing these flowers, know for certain that in this aeon there will be that many Buddhas appearing in the world. At that time, there arises an atmosphere called highly purified light, which makes the mansions of the heavens of the realms of form. There arises an atmosphere called a rays of pure lights, which makes the mansions of the heavens of the world of desire. There arises an atmosphere called firm, dense, and indestructible, which makes the great and small peripheral mountains and the iron mountains. There arises an atmosphere called supremely high, which makes the polar mountains. There arises an atmosphere called immovable, which makes the ten great mountains. There arises an atmosphere called stabilization, which makes the earth. There arises an atmosphere called adornment, which makes the palaces of the earth and sky of the water and sound spirits. There arises an atmosphere called inexhaustible treasury, which makes all the oceans of the billion worlds. There arises an atmosphere called treasury of universal light, which makes all the jewels of the billion worlds. There arises an atmosphere called steadfast root, which makes all the wish-fulfilling trees of the, brilliant, of the billion worlds. The one flavored water rained by the great clouds has no distinction. But because the roots of goodness of sentient beings are not the same, the atmospheres are not the same, and because of the differences of the atmospheres, the worlds are different. 
The manifestation of Buddha is also like this, replete with the virtues of all roots of goodness, emitting the light of unexcelled great knowledge, called inconceivable knowledge, perpetuating the lineage of Buddhas, illumining all worlds in the ten directions, giving the enlightening beings the prediction that they will be coronated by all Buddhas, attaining true enlightenment and appear in the world. The Buddha's manifesting has another, the Buddha manifesting has another light of unexcelled great knowledge called pure and undefiled, which makes the untainted and exhaustible knowledge of the enlightened. There is another light of unexcelled great knowledge called universal illumination, which makes unexcelled great knowledge, called, which makes the Buddha's inconceivable knowledge universally penetrate the realm of reality. There is another light of unexcelled great knowledge called sustaining the nature of Buddhahood, which makes the insuperable power of Buddha. There is another light of unexcelled great knowledge called outstanding and incorruptible, which makes the Buddha's fearless and, and incorruptible knowledge. There is another light of unexcelled great knowledge called all spiritual powers, which makes Buddha's unique qualities and omniscience. There is another light of unexcelled great knowledge called producing mystic transformation, which makes Buddha's knowledge and how, of how to cause the roots of goodness produced by saying, hearing, and attending Buddha to not be lost or decay. There is another light of unexcelled great knowledge called universal accord, which makes Buddha's body of endless virtue and knowledge doing what is beneficial for all beings. There is another light of unexcelled great knowledge called inexhaustible, which makes Buddha's extremely profound, subtle knowledge, causing the lineage of the three treasures not to die out according to those who are enlightened by it. There is another light of unexcelled great knowledge called various adornments, which makes the glorified body of Buddha gladdening all sentient beings. There is another light of unexcelled great knowledge called indestructible, which makes the inexhaustible supreme lifespan of Buddha equal to the cosmos and the realm of space. Buddha's water of the one flavor of compassion has no distinction, but because sentient beings' inclinations are not the same and their faculties and characters are different, it produces various atmospheres of great knowledge, enabling the sentient beings to accomplish the actual manifestation of Buddhahood. All Buddhas are one and the same in essence. From the sphere of great knowledge, they produce various kinds of lights of knowledge. You should know that Buddha from the single flavor of liberation, produces infinite inconceivable qualities of various kinds which sentient beings think are products of the Buddha's supernormal powers, but which actually are not created by the supernormal powers of Buddha. There is not a single enlightening being who can ever attain even a little bit of the knowledge and wisdom of Buddhas without having planted roots of goodness in the company of Buddhas. It is just that, by the spiritual power of the Buddha, sentient beings are enabled to embody the qualities of Buddhahood, yet the Buddhas have no discrimination. There is no creation, no destruction, no creator, and nothing created. This is the eighth characteristic of the manifestation of Buddha. And a great enlightening being should know it as such. Furthermore, it is like the arising of four atmospheres in space that contain that can sustain the sphere of water. Of these four, one is called stability, the second permanence, the third ultimacy, and the fourth firmness. These four atmospheres can sustain the sphere of water. The sphere of water can sustain the earth and prevent it from falling apart. Therefore, it is said that the sphere of earth rests on the sphere of water. The sphere of water rests on the atmosphere. The atmosphere rests on space. And space does not rest on anything. But though space does not rest on anything, it enables the universe to abide. The manifestation of Buddha is also like this, producing Buddha's four kinds of atmosphere of great knowledge based on the unimpeded light of wisdom, able to sustain the roots of goodness of all sentient beings. What are those four? The atmosphere of great knowledge taking care of all sentient beings and inspiring joy in them. The atmosphere of great knowledge setting up right teaching and causing sentient beings to take to it. The atmosphere of great knowledge preserving all sentient beings' roots of goodness. The atmosphere of great knowledge containing all appropriate means arriving at the realm where there are no taints or contaminations. The Buddhas benevolently rescue all living beings compassionately liberate all living beings. Their great benevolence and compassion universally obey, aiding all. 
However, great benevolence and great compassion rest on great skill in art. Great skill in art rests on the manifestation of Buddha. The manifestation of Buddha rests on the light of unimpeded wisdom. The light of unimpeded wisdom does not rest on anything. This is the ninth characteristic of the manifestation of Buddha. Great enlightening beings should know it as such. Furthermore, once the billion universe has formed, it benefits countless various sentient beings. The water creatures receive the benefits of the water. The land creatures receive the benefits of the land. The sky creatures receive the benefits of the sky. In the same way, the manifestation of Buddha variously benefits all kinds of beings. Those who become joyful on seeing the Buddha, on seeing Buddha gain the benefit of joy. Those who abide by the pure precepts gain the benefit of pure conduct. Those who abide in the meditations, concentrations, and immeasurable minds gain the benefit of transmundane spiritual powers of saints. Those who abide in the lights of the ways of entry into the teaching gain the benefit of the non-dissolution of cause and effect. Those who abide in the light of non-existence gain the benefit of non-dissolution of all truths. Therefore, we say the manifestation of Buddha benefits all sentient beings, and this is the tenth characteristic of the manifestation of Buddha. Great enlightening beings should know it as such. When great enlightening beings know the manifestation of Buddha, they know it is infinite because they know it consummates infinite practices. Then they know it is immensely vast because they know it pervades the ten directions. Then they know it has no coming or going because they know it is apart from birth, subsistence, and extinction. Then they know it has no action and nothing acted upon because they know it is beyond mind, intellect, and consciousness. Then they know it is impartial because they know all sentient beings have no self. Then they know it is endless because they know it pervades all lands without end. Then they know it is unreceding because they know it will never be stopped in the future. Then they know it has no decay because the Buddha's knowledge has no counterpart. Then they know it is non-dual because they know Buddha equally observes the conditional and the unconditional. Then they know all sentient beings gain benefit because the dedication of Buddha's original vows are freely fulfilled. Then the enlightening being universally good, wishing to restate his point, spoke these verses where we will begin in the next session. Ah, from page 979, we dedicate the merit for all of you beings to realize the enlightening being in you and discover the enlightened being in you beyond you being no being and they being no enlightening being and no enlightened being and, or, and indivisible from them in the free creativity of the illusory and magnificent world of great love and compassion within enlightenment. And may you all swiftly become fully aware and able to manifest the Buddha just like this. And it, what blows my mind, this... These, this passage, starting from the prose passage on page, uh, you know, the three or four page, 974 to 978, four or five pages before, is like a genesis. It's like Buddhist genesis. So you have the genesis of the world, and there is an over-god in there, which would be Brahma Shikin, the highest form realm Brahma who is normally a bodhisattva in the inconceivable liberation on the seventh stage, who wants to be a god to a benefit being. And so he has a hand, but, he, but it's done with all beings together, not by himself. But he can do most, be of most benefit to beings within that. That's his, why he wants to be born in that way. And on, on their physical life, that is, on their benefit of their life. And then at the same time, there is a Buddhahood creating you know, it's like exactly the same as the creation of a, Bu of a Buddhahood. It's just as vast and just as galactic and just as extraordinary as, as in time as creating a Buddhahood. That's like creating in the space a universe and creating in time a Buddhahood. That's really exciting. It's, it's a, a most fascinating. I have never dreamed of such a passage. I, I looked at this. I never saw this passage. 
I looked many times at this sutra and I didn't find this passage until today, thanks to you. So I dedicate all this merit to all of you. May you quickly become Vairochana Buddhas. And may you quickly, therefore, enable yourself, enable all beings to just as quickly become Vairochana Buddhas and be equal to you. You don't want to become Vairochana Buddha to dominate those beings. You want to be Vairochana Buddha to be equal to those beings. You all, it will all be mutually exactly equal. Universal good in all directions. So that's what we dedicated to. That's really amazing. Thank you. And then may, may we dedicate it in a more conventional manner to quick peace in the Ukraine. Ukraine, I understand, in the Ukrainian language means the borderland. So it's a kind of melting pot, like America. It has the ideal of being, like India actually is, and like America is always trying to be, but not really because of the genocide that it was based in, which is, which is not complete and therefore can be redeemed. But it isn't yet. Ay, ay, ay. But may there quickly be that peace. Please, may the manifestation of Buddha exercise themselves quickly to heal the disease of that one person who conceived of this silly thing, in a way manifesting a fantasy from ancient time. And but, but engaging in the wrong kind of conquest, the poor thing. Like the Emperor Ashoka, you know, the great Emperor Ashoka, he did conquer and made an empire. And then the last terrible battle was the Battle of Kalinga, sort of what is now an area of what is now Orissa, an Andhra Pradesh area. And then he happened to ride as the conquering emperor rode over the battlefield after his victory. And then he saw the wailing of the widows because they just left bodies there and they went to try to find their families and things. And he saw the agony of it all and then he repented of that. And then he said, okay, conquest is soft power. You know, conquest is by Russian competing in rock groups, competing athletics, competing in medicines, competing in excellent tech, and competing in their own kind of Facebook as well. And inter-translation inter technology so we can all understand each other's languages and so on so perfectly well. So we won't be unhappy not knowing what the other people are saying. And they, that is the way to conquer. That's the good side of the American thing. It's the Hollywood you know, done by the wonderful people, global people who, who made beauty and dancing musicals and detective mysteries and, and brought out the talent and the imagination of people. Star Trek, Star Wars, Close Encounters. Okay, that's the better way of conquering, not by killing.